From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says it's on Hamas to decide whether to accept Israel's extraordinarily generous ceasefire proposal on his seventh trip to the Middle East since October 7th. Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace joins us with more this hour. As those negotiations continue, pro-Palestinian protests engulf college campuses across the country. Students today at Columbia defy an order to leave the encampment on their campus. House Speaker Mike Johnson warning Congress will take action to protect Jewish students, suggesting the House will consider cutting federal funding to some schools. We'll have more on the work ahead as lawmakers return to Washington with Isaac Boltanski of BTIG. So, Joe, here in Washington, the focus very much on what's happening in New York, frankly, elsewhere in other cities like Austin on these campuses, which really uh, paint a stark contrast as we have these pro-Palestinian protests at the same time they are trying to reach a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. Yeah, it's a story that really uh, engulfs the world. In this case, domestically, Joe Biden is dealing with a very controversial issue, especially among his progressive base. Even as the Secretary of State conducts more shuttle diplomacy, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Israel this week, Kaylee, there is talk that we could be on the verge of a ceasefire deal, something that could be lasting involving the exchange of hostages. Uh, but it's unclear at what time this could happen. It actually came up today at the White House and Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, talking about uh, this offer from Israel as they wait for Hamas to respond. Here she is. The onus is indeed on Hamas. There is a deal on the table and they need to take it. We believe that all efforts need to be brought to bear to convince Hamas to accept the proposal immediately. We're joined now for more by Bloomberg's Jordan Fabian, who covers the White House for us. So, Jordan, as we hear the administration pushing Hamas to take this deal or respond to the deal, as we heard from the Secretary of State uh, in Saudi Arabia earlier today, is that really his primary objective is getting a deal done while he's in the region? Or is he still busy trying to convince Israel not to move into Rafah? Well, I think it's both. I mean, these next few days are going to tell us a lot about whether there's going to be a ceasefire or if Israel is going to proceed with that offensive. There's supposed to be talks in Cairo tomorrow, on uh, Tuesday, uh, featuring uh, Israelis, uh, the Egyptian and Qatari officials who've been moderating this, and representatives from Hamas. Now, there's been optimism that uh, there could be a deal. Israel has lowered the number of hostages it said it would require. Uh, to see a deal. But there's still other things that need to be worked out, like the length of a ceasefire, like whether Palestinians can have immediate return to Gaza. If those conditions are satisfied, we could see a deal. But if those negotiations fall apart, you could see Israel moving very quickly to prepare for that Rafa offensive. Well, as Speaker uh, Mike Johnson uh, makes news today, he was, of course, on Columbia's campus last weekend as the university tries to break up the encampment here. And he's talking about potential congressional action uh, not towards the conflict in Gaza, but to college campuses with an announcement today. Here's what we heard from the speaker. With regard to the funding, we're, we're looking at very seriously uh, reducing or eliminating any federal funds at all to campuses who cannot maintain basic safety and security of Jewish students. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous to say that this is what it's come to, but that's what we're looking at. Jordan, is this just messaging from the speaker here? Could something like that actually get through this Congress in legislative form? It's hard to say. The White House didn't really bite one way or the other uh, yeah. when asked about this today. But look, you're seeing uh, you know, politicians, even though the, the protests aren't really about Joe Biden or Congress, you're seeing them rush in and they see political opportunity in what's happening on these college campuses for sure. Republicans uh, using them to try and uh, accuse Joe Biden of, of fostering this uh, you know, atmosphere of chaos in the United States. You know, they link it to you know, crime in cities, you know, protests on college campuses, you know, raising questions about will the left eat their own like they did in 1968 with massive protests later this summer outside their convention. And 
And on the other hand, you have you know, Joe Biden trying to distance himself from what's going on in those college campuses, you know, denouncing some of the anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, that you've heard from some of those demonstrators. So while it's not about the politicians in Washington, there's certainly a lot of fallout for them. Yeah, Jordan, thank you for being with us. Jordan Fabian, White House correspondent at Bloomberg, as we turn now to the campaign trail where Donald Trump met with his one-time rival, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. They did so over the weekend. And we turn now to Bloomberg's Nancy Cook, who has had deep sources within both camps here. Nancy, I can't imagine what you thought as they finally got in the same room in Hollywood, Florida. This, of course, is Ron DeSanctimonious. And I know that <laughs> Donald Trump retired that name officially. I don't think he's retired Meatball Ron yet. The point is that was a brutal campaign. What's in it for Ron DeSantis to get together with Donald Trump right now? What's in it for Ron DeSantis is that he definitely wants to run for president in 2028. Um, even after he dropped out, he had a meeting with donors. You know, he is trying to keep the, the real hope alive among his supporters that he will be, uh, you know, the, the front runner when he runs again mm -hmm. in 2028. And so he really can't afford to alienate Trump's base. You know, Trump has such a strong grip in the Republican Party. And, and Ron DeSantis, you know, wants those people in four years to come along and support him. Mm -hmm. What's in it for Trump is that Trump needs to expand his base of fundraisers. And Ron DeSantis has been very effective at cultivating a network of very wealthy Floridians um, during his, uh, you know, he's in his second term as Florida governor. And, and that's kind of, I don't think they really like each other, but I think that they <laughs> both see something that they could get from each other. Can Trump really get the people who were DeSantis donors, though? Because a lot of them were donating to DeSantis specifically because he was an alternative mm -hmm. to Donald Trump. How much overlap is there really in the Venn diagram of who will support these two? That's a good question. There already has been some um, overlap. Um, we saw uh, Mr. Bigelow, who is a donor from Nevada, who has already come around and supported Trump. He supported DeSantis at first. Um, and so I think that, you know, the Trump people are sort of on the hunt for billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and there is a lot of money in Florida now, particularly with Wall Street moving down there. And I think that they are just, you know, really looking for support as much as I can get it. Well, on to the Veep stakes here. Yeah. This is fascinating to me. We've got a fundraiser coming up this weekend that looks like the next uh, episode of The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance was asked about this idea of potentially running for Trump on Fox News Sunday. Here's how he responded. I talk to President Trump a lot. Uh, we're very close. I've never spoken to him about being vice president, so I assume that a lot of this is media speculation. Of course, if he asked me, I'd have to think seriously about it because I think it's really important that he win. The world is on fire, and I sort of see Donald Trump as a bit of a fireman. I don't know if there is even such thing as a shortlist at this point. You can tell us if J.D. Vance is on it, but there are several others, some familiar names here. Doug Burgum among them, who appears to be rising to the top. He's gonna, they're all going to be pulled into a room with donors this weekend. Do they end up in the boardroom at the end and he <laughs> hires someone? How does this work? So um, I, I did talk with some Trump sources today. I will say that they are um, sort of vetting people. And there are a bunch of people who want to be the VP who are getting themselves ready. They're talking with policy experts. They're hiring lawyers to get their finances in order. And so people are getting ready. I think that, you know, this being Trump and him being a master of messaging, mm -hmm. He is going to draw out this process as long as possible, both to have all these people competing for his approval, but also to keep sort of this interesting media storyline going, I would say right up until the convention. Doug Burgum is definitely on the list, but there's a, a bunch of people on the list. You know, Lee Stefanik is on the list, uh, Tim Scott. Uh, you know, Byron Donalds of Florida. The list is long and it's it's not being winnowed down. And so what's going to happen this weekend is there's a big uh, Republican National Committee donor retreat in Palm Beach, Trump's backyard. He is speaking there. And a bunch of these VP candidates will also be sort of talking and schmoozing. They've done this a lot on the campaign trail, so it's not that unusual. Um, but one of my Trump sources calls it, you know, auditioning for daddy's approval over and over again. <laughs> All right, then. All right, Bloomberg's Nancy Cook, always with an eye on Trump world. Thank you so much. Now coming up, we'll turn back to the ramifications of a potential temporary ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace will be with us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
right now, as you said, uh, Hamas has before it a proposal that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous uh, on the part of Israel. And in this moment, the only thing standing between the people of Gaza and a ceasefire is Hamas. That was Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the World Economic Forum earlier today in Saudi Arabia speaking about the proposal Israel has offered Hamas in relation to a ceasefire. For more, we're joined now by Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. Aaron, always great to have you here on Balance of Power. Arguably, if Hamas were to do what Israel wants and release something in the ballpark of 30 to 40 hostages, it would lose leverage if Israel agrees to a deal, it would probably not be able to go into Rafa for the foreseeable future. Is a ceasefire really in the in interest of either side right now? And how does that inform your thinking about whether or not this ultimately will happen? You know, it's a fascinating question. And <clears throat> negotiations, there are many reasons that negotiations succeed. One of them is urgency. Uh, the two parties feel a certain amount of pain accompanied by the prospects of gain. So it's the pain ga gain balance that determines whether the status quo changes. I I'm not entirely persuaded either Hamas nor the government of Israel <coughs> is feels all that much urgency right now. I think the party that feels the urgency for any number of reasons is the Biden administration. Because without an Israeli Ham Hamas a hostage for prisoner exchange, the administration cannot free hostages they can't de-escalate Israeli military activity uh, for six weeks or six months. Uh, and they can't find a way to surge badly needed humanitarian assistance into Gaza. So without that, I I'm afraid you you'd have to hang a kind of close for the season sign on uh, U.S. policy in an effort, uh, I think it's quite clear, to change the pictures in Gaza and to do it reasonably uh, soon for any number of reasons, for policy reasons, for moral reasons, and of course for uh, for political reasons. We may, however, be closer than we've been in a long time to actually seeing uh, an agreement. But as I mentioned, these negotiations usually have two speeds, slow uh, and slow. Well, with that said, it seems like it would help to have everyone at the table here, Aaron, who's going to show up in Cairo? Hamas has not been clear about its feelings uh, overall about this proposal or whether it will send a delegation to Cairo for talks tomorrow. How do you see this unfolding even in the next 24 hours? You know, part of the uniqueness of this negotiation is that the principal decision maker on the Palestinian side, Yahya Sinwar, um, the architect of the October 7 terror surge, is, is communicating probably 20, 30 meters below ground in a tunnel structure, uh, either below Rafa, Khan Yunus, or maybe even in Sinai. And for the last six months, the Israelis have been looking for the senior leadership because if they find the senior leadership, you know the hostages will be very close and well protected, but they haven't been able to. So it's a very curious negotiation. Uh, he's the principal decision maker, and yet it is the external leadership that will show up in Cairo, uh, not, by the way, at a necessarily as a senior level, working level, but the Israelis will send a working level um, delegation. Look, if the past is prologue, the one guy who uh, is not in this picture right now, CIA Director Bill Burns, I would keep your eye on whether or not uh, Bill Burns is going to travel. He's been a key uh, component uh, with respect to these negotiations over the last four months. I still think there's a reasonable chance, reasonable chance, that you can see a deal. But remember, even if you got six weeks, uh, Hamas will hold 50 hostages, the males, both civilian and military. And what they will want in exchange for those 50 is literally to empty the Israeli prisons, thousands of Palestinian prisoners, and they'll want a comprehensive ceasefire. That's going to be an extremely difficult lift uh, on the Israeli side. Well, something that could also make this process more difficult, according to our reporting, the concerns of the U.S. and allies, that the International Criminal Court could be issuing warrants for Israeli officials. Do you think that's actually likely to happen? And what would that do to this entire effort? You know, the, the, the Karim Khan, the chief prosecutor, already has a war crimes case against Israel and Hamas based on the conflict in 2014. Uh, the, of course, the U.S. and uh, and Israel uh, do not accept the ju jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. The, the Americans have said, by the way, that they don't have jurisdiction. They're not a factor in this. 
but you have 20, 123 and 24 countries that in fact are members of the ICC? And should these warrants be actually issued? It would make travel increasingly fraught for the prime minister, for the Israeli chief of staff, and for the minister of defense. And we know that part of that phone call, even though the White House isn't talking about it, part of that phone call between Netanyahu and the president was, was clearly, mm -hmm. I'm sure, a creed de core plea from the Israeli prime minister to help beat back any effort um, with respect to ICC intervention in, in, this particular, uh, in this particular crisis. I want to ask you about what's happening on uh, the campus of Columbia University and college campuses all over the country, Aaron. I'm curious your view. We spoke earlier with founder and CEO of Greenwich Media Strategies, a former director for Syria and Lebanon at the National Security Council, now at Columbia University, Hagar Shamali, and her take uh, on the future of the protests that are unfolding around the country. Here's what she said. We'll have you respond. I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. And, and this is the thing, I, a lot of, I think a lot of folks hope that the professors are hoping, okay, but the summer is coming and then students are gonna go home. But the administration seems to believe and expect that these protests are going to continue until the election at least. And that they're going to use the election and the, and the, the te political de banter and, and focus to highlight this issue even more. Aaron, we've only got about a minute left. What do I mean, people in really, Israel I mean, it's hard think of these protests? It's hard, it's hard to unpack this. I, I can only say that I, I was at the University of Michigan in the 70s during Vietnam. Um, been 27 years in government. Never have I seen any foreign policy issue, royal domestic politics, and, and the campuses as this one has. Not, has. not even U.S. deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan, where Americans were fighting and dying. There were protests, yes, but this sort of intensity, and we were also involved, not willfully or intentionally, in killing thousands of Afghans and Iraqis. So I, I, I really can't explain this. We live in an argue culture in this country where people have been driven to their corners, where passion is high, where rational dialogue and debate is not, is, is not encouraged even, and the word compromise. Henry Clay was the great compromiser. Senator? Uh, in the 19th century, no Republican, my judgment, would want to be called the great compromiser today. So I think this is a reflection of the sort of pernicious polarization. A lot of other factors as well here, but I would agree with your previous guest. I don't think this comment, I don't think this is going away. It's not the conventions. Then come the, come the fall, depending on this stuff, how this is resolved, I suspect this issue will be back at it. An, Israeli Hamas, an end to the Israeli-Hamas war, um, security and prosperity for Israelis and the 2.3 million Gazans would certainly uh, help diminish the uh, activism here. But we're a very, very, very long way away from that. I appreciate your joining us as always. Aaron David Miller, we thank you for being with us on Bloomberg. Coming up as World Press Freedom Day approaches this week, We'll speak with Pavel Batorin, the husband of a journalist who is currently detained in Russia. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Journalism is clearly not a crime, not here, not there, not anywhere in the world. And Putin should release Evan and also immediately. President Biden in an important moment this weekend at the White House Correspondents' Dinner in which he named journalists currently being detained in Russia. One of them, Alsa Kumarsheva, is an American reporter who was detained in Russia back in October, arrested and charged with failure to register as a foreign agent. After entering the country to visit a family member, she faces up to five years in prison there, having had her detention extended just this month. Joining now uh, here on Balance of Powers, also his husband, Pavel Batorin, who has been advocating for her safe return home and was in the audience that night when the president called out his wife's name. And I'm sure that was quite a moment for you. I welcome you to the table. It's great to see you. Thanks for having um, me. I want to start with uh, the conditions in which she's being held, a five square meter cell. There's no hot water. There's not even a toilet. 
How was her condition? My communication with Elsa is very limited. Um, um, the Russian government has been denying phone calls um, um, uh, with her family. Uh, only once did we hear her voice when she was able to speak to journalists when she actually detailed some of the uh, abhorrent conditions that she's held in. Yeah. She is held in a very t uh, in a tiny cell uh, with no room to move. Um, um, she doesn't belong there. She belongs with her family back uh, in Prague, where we're based. So her ability to communicate with you is limited, but you have the ability to communicate with others on her behalf. What kind of conversations while you've been here in Washington have you had with officials from the administration? What are they telling you about how, how much they're going to be able to help also? Well, here in Washington, we have been advocating for her designation as wrongfully detained uh, by the State Department. While I understand that the designation alone will not bring her home, I think it's an important step towards her release. Um, but I was, um, uh, I was incredibly grateful to the president for um, uh, calling, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, calling uh, on the, the Russian leader to release both Evan and Al Su. Well, it seems you shouldn't have one without the other. If the commander-in-chief is naming her in a forum like that with the world watching, what's keeping the government from naming that designation? Well, now that we've heard it from the president, I think it's up to, this, uh, the to the State Department to, to follow suit. Um, I believe that uh, also has been detained wrongfully. My children also watched uh, a clip uh, from uh, uh, the president's speech, and it gives us a great deal of comfort to know that uh, also's government... Uh, is behind her, that we have the support of this administration. Well, you have the support that doesn't make the work of actually getting her home. Uh, maybe it makes it a, a bit less difficult, but still it is clearly difficult work as we have seen how difficult it is uh, to get others out as well. What level of optimism are officials sharing with you? Um, well, uh, their optimism is somewhat... Um, constrained by the fact that it's the Russian government that holds the keys to Alsu's cell. Um, and we understand the complexities and the difficulties of dealing with the Russian government. Um, um, but listen, um, I've been dealing with the situation for many months now. I have two daughters who are at a very tender age, have been without their mother for many months now. I mean, I'm doing the best I can as a single parent, but there's that undeniable bond between a mother and her daughters that I simply cannot replace. We want also back. I can't imagine. What was their response when they heard the president over the weekend? Oh, they were so happy. Uh, again, um, Alsu has a lot of support on the Hill uh, from bo both parties. Yeah. We just need a little bit more support from the, from the government. That's got to be a legitimizing moment for them, though. Uh, yes, um, and listen, my uh, elder daughter, who is 50, she's turning 16, she's, you know, uh, about two years away from being able to vote <laughs> in elections, I think. Uh, she also wants to, to, to see that support coming from the government mm -hmm. to secure uh, the release of their mother. Well, and she's not just a mother. She obviously is a journalist, and you're a journalist yourself. How should we be thinking about her case and what it means for other journalists trying to operate and do their jobs in areas where it may be difficult and sensitive to do so. How do you rethink your own work? Well, we know that Russia is not a safe place for journalists, not a safe place for Americans. Um, um, we, uh, we're now having to find new ways of reporting about Russia from outside of Russia. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's an unsafe environment, but we, we stand ready to, to respond to those challenges. Um, uh, it's too late for me to dwell on the past and think, well, maybe she shouldn't, of course, she shouldn't have gone. Mm -hmm. But I'm now focused on the now, on our efforts to uh, secure her release. Has it made your own work more complicated, or are you working full-time on her release? Uh, yeah, I have that day job, too, of leading yeah. Current Time TV at Radio Free of Radio Liberty. We yeah. continue to, to provide uncensored uh, information uh, to Russian audiences inside and outside Russia. It's amazing, and... Obviously, while you are able to share so much with so many who are able to get that information from you, as you told us at the very beginning, you can't get much to also herself right now. If she could hear you doing this interview, what would you tell her? I would tell her, also, we love you. We want you back. There's a worldwide campaign for your release. Your government has got your back. We'll get your back home. You'll see your children soon. Does she know that, the extent to which 
this is being talked about in the highest levels of the U.S. government? I think she has been able to receive some information, maybe not to the fullest extent, about the, the World Well campaign and, and our media appearances, yes. And she very much appreciates it. I want her to know that, especially now, after uh, the president has called on the Russian leader to release her, uh, she will most certainly uh, know that and appreciate that effort. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when the president did so, he mentioned another journalist who was in a similar position, and Evan Gershkovich. Have you spoken with, with his family, with his parents, someone who's a family that's going through a very similar situation to yours? Oh, yes, I've spoken with them many times. Um, I have nothing but respect for Evan and his family. I stand with Evan, and I appreciate the, um, the support that we've also received from the Wall Street Journal um, uh, in our effort to secure Alsu's release. Um, Alsu uh, and Evan, um, they, they don't belong in Russian prison cells. They belong with their families. Um, in Alsu's case, she wasn't even there doing her work as a journalist. She went there on a humanitarian trip, and the Russian government just captured her in the middle of this act of kindness. We want her back. All right. I'm going to leave it on that note. Pavel, thank you so much thank you for, for joining me. us and sharing a bit of Alsu's story. Pavel Batorin, of course, her husband. We appreciate your time. Now, switching gears, Congress is back in session after a short recess last week following the passage and signing of the foreign aid package. The question is, what work is still ahead and can they get it done? Joining us now is Isaac Boltanski, BTIG Managing Director and Director of Policy Research. Isaac, thank you so much for being here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV in radio. Now that they're back and they're going to be working for about four weeks straight, what do you think is the first order of business? And is it going to be easily done from here after bipartisanship was found on the foreign aid bill? You know, it's hard to pivot to the silliness of, of my city after hearing the interview that, that you just conducted and, and an issue so important and so personal, but we'll do our best, right? And, and here's the story on D.C. It's going to be quiet for the next few months, and I think that markets should enjoy that peace and quiet because it's going to be an incredibly long and taxing uh, uh, campaign season. And then next year is going to be very, very busy with trillions of dollars in tax cuts coming up uh, for expiration and the debt ceiling coming back. So what I'm telling my clients yeah. is, look, we're going to watch the FAA bill, which is due by May 10th, because maybe that's a vehicle for these acute issues like stable coins and cannabis banking. But really, it's going to be quiet from, from Congress for the next few months, and we should be thankful for that. Well, let's talk about that FAA reauthorization, uh, because we keep hearing that might be the last train to leave the station, or I guess plane would be the correct metaphor. And I talked about it earlier with Maya McGinnis, uh, because we're hearing this could be lit up into a big Christmas tree with a lot of decorations. You mentioned a couple possibilities there with stablecoin, uh, maybe safe banking. Here's what she said. I think there'll be many people who make runs at attaching their bills, the things they prefer. But listen, everybody in the House has an election that they want to get back home and start focusing on. There is a, it's a very difficult tightrope to walk to get certain things attached or not. So I think there's a risk of a Christmas tree, but I think the most likely outcome is that it passes without anything major being attached to it. So, Isaac, uh, how bright is this tree going to be? We're talking about amendments and, and how many uh, extra issues could be added to this one? What's your forecast? Yeah, so look, I am always cautious of, of the fact that in D.C. things are impossible right up until they're inevitable. So I, I am watching this closely, but I am bearish on this becoming a big, broad mm. Christmas tree. Uh, the clock is ticking. And, you know, we talk about some of these issues that clients care about. So cannabis banking is one that matters greatly for that whole uh, ecosystem. And then stablecoin legislation, obviously, could be meaningful for, for uh, that corner of the marketplace. We've got to keep in mind. They still don't actually have an agreement on the stablecoin bill, and uh, Senator McConnell is still opposed to the cannabis portion of it. So there's no real reason to be bullish about that for the time being. And and in terms of you know the last plane leaving the station, as you so aptly say, I, I would just note that there are going to be a few more bills that we're going to have to watch after the election. Um, the annual defense bill has become law 60 years in a row. That's going to become law again. That could be the real Christmas tree from my seat. Okay, fair enough. Um, 
will be on Christmas tree watch, perhaps a bit closer to actual Christmas if it's after the election, Isaac, instead of having that conversation in what feels like summertime in Washington today. So there is a question on the work that Congress has ahead of it, but also work that already has been done that is going to result in consequences moving forward. As part of this foreign aid bill that we know they passed, there was a TikTok divest or ban bill attached to it. What happens next in that saga, knowing that ByteDance has vowed to fight that divestiture in court, China would have to sign off on it. If you're a, a U.S. A person in the U.S. trying to figure out what's going on with TikTok, what realistically happens as a result of this legislation? Yeah, this is a perfect example of that the things in D.C. being impossible until they're inevitable. And I've got to tell you, a lot of clients were surprised because we're so conditioned for D.C. to do nothing. And they show that they're able to do something here. And it's really noteworthy that the that the tone and tenor regarding TikTok changed on the Hill. And you could see that sentiment shift. But the next step is harder. And look, I'm telling my clients, I think that we're going to have litigation that could push this all the way in to uh, mid-2026. And so uh, and, and on that end with the litigation, while I'm sympathetic to the argument that the government has the right to ban TikTok, it's ultimately going to be up to the courts. And that is a lengthy process, and it's becoming increasingly murky, uh, given some of the political dynamics at play in the judiciary. So from a TikTok user perspective, you've got a couple more years and a minimum uh, before I think the, the courts will have the final say on that matter. So we had a tax deal, Isaac. Everybody was excited months back about, gosh, look, we can work together. Look how fast it happened. And we had a, what seemed to be a fairly balanced trade between an extended child tax credit and more favorable business taxes. Then everybody got real quiet. Senators started to have problems with that particular arrangement. Now that we're beyond tax day, is it over? Look, it's dead. And and I think that, that we dead. can spend a lot of time um, uh, trying to understand why, because this should have become law. It's not just that there was this basic agreement between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats got the child tax credit. Republicans got mm -hmm. the business extenders they want. It would also stop the employee retention credit, the ERC, which is just rife with fraud. And it would put an end to that. This should have become law. But it didn't. And I think it didn't become law because there are some senior Republicans who believe that next year they're going to have the Senate, which is a good bet, and they prefer to negotiate on their terms next year. And so that's why it died, and that's why we're going to wait until next year. And it adds even more pressure to what's going to be a year dominated by fiscal themes. Hmm. We always seem to be piling on the pressure, don't we, Isaac? Certainly there's a lot of high-pressure situations out there right now, including at many college campuses across the country. We, of course, saw what happened at Columbia University today where student protesters refused to leave the encampment after a deadline that the university set. And we also heard from House Speaker Mike Johnson, who posted a video on Twitter suggesting that Congress could take action to protect Jewish students, potentially cutting funding to some schools. How likely is it in your mind that Congress could actually do that and that that would be something that would get a signature from President Biden? It's highly unlikely that Congress is going to act on this in a material way. I do think that we're going to see a fair amount of jawboning from all over D.C. And you're going to have hearings, you're going to have uh, symposia, you're going to have all of those things. But we're not going to see actual legislation here. I think that this is one of those examples where you see D.C. shaking its fist and both sides angry at each other, but there being absolutely no consensus regarding how to legislate on this type of issue. And it's frankly just too fast moving for a Congress that, that doesn't have the, the capacity to be nimble. So look, I think we're gonna hear a lot of headlines, but we're not gonna see actual legislating on this. Mike Johnson gonna be speaker at the end of this Congress? Yeah. He's outlasted everyone's bets. Um, and I think, you know, you can you can give him plaudits and you should for uh, being able to move forward with this foreign spending supplemental. But it's hard to not look at the fact that just a few months ago we were going to have the exact same foreign aid supplemental plus meaningful structural shifts to the country's immigration policy. And so it's hard not to, to look at it and say, well, it's great that he accomplished that, but goodness gracious, they left a lot on the table that I think uh, could have been net positive from an immigration policy perspective.
It's great to have you back, Isaac. Isaac Boltanski, we thank you for joining Balance of Power once again. Coming up, Columbia student protesters defy warnings. They'll be suspended if they choose to continue protesting on the university property. If you're with us on Bloomberg TV, you can see that as we speak. We're going to dive into this issue coming up with our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I don't know if you need to call in the National Guard. Maybe you just call in the police, right? Uh, this is often framed as a free speech debate. Uh, everyone accepts that there are time, place, and manner restrictions. These guys have the right to peacefully protest, even if we criticize uh, the, 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 the message. They do not have the right to set up tent cities on our public spaces and turn our cities into garbage dumps. That, that is what I think we should not allow, and I think the police should be able to handle that job pretty easily. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance speaking on Fox News yesterday about the protesters that today are occupying college campuses around the country. Let's assemble our political panel to get into this. Rick Davis is here of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. They are both Bloomberg politics contributors and great to see you both. Jeannie, you make a living on a college campus and not everyone agrees with J.D. Vance. A couple of his colleagues like Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley have in fact called for the National Guard to be used, uh, which would be pretty remarkable as we approach this weekend, the 54th anniversary of the Kent State shootings. Is that where this is going? You know, I hope not. I hope that the universities are able to manage this without involving the National Guard. Um, you know, I don't think that was effective in the past. I don't think it would be effective now. I do agree with him, though, on the fact that, that there are, you know, it, it, there is a time to protest and there is a way to do it that is legal. And there is there are people stepping over the line and the universities do have to manage that. And so that's what we're seeing. You know, one thing I would just caution is that we have seen because of the coverage and, you know, people get an outsized impact about how many students are doing this. It is still a very, very, very small percentage of students at our universities and colleges that are acting in a way that is illegal. And I think we need to stress that point because of the coverage. It looks to be a lot more than it actually is percentage wise. Well, and certainly you're seeing the drama played up uh, by some on Capitol Hill, including the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, who was at Columbia University speaking last week. And then again today, Rick suggested that Congress may take action to protect Jewish students, even if it means pulling funding from some of these schools. We just spoke with Isaac Boltanski of BTIG, and he suggested he doesn't think that has a chance of actually becoming reality. What do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, there are going to be a lot of message bills now that all the major decisions have been made by Congress. Uh, they're going to do a lot of messaging and legislation that sort of makes a point, right? So whether there's a bill that actually can get through, you know, the, uh, the, the House and the Senate and signed by the president is, is a slim margin of victory. But uh, the reality is that these are people who set standards for our country, regardless of what the bill passes or not. And, and I think it's a, I applaud Congress for actually getting out in front of this. Uh, you know, Elise Stefanik uh, wound up uh, being the forerunner of this. And nobody would have ever bet on that at the beginning of this year. <laughs> but her hearings have actually uh, paid dividends because it's, it's started to create some accountability for these university presidents who look the other way when these kinds of anti-Semitic slurs are kicked around their campus. And now it's exploded in the full range of view. And I don't know any uh, students uh, who want to get an education or parents who are paying for tuition or uh, donors who support these universities who think that the conduct of these university presidents has been adequate. Of course, Rick, nobody would have bet at this point that Mike Johnson would be Speaker of the House, uh, I think we can say. And interesting, as lawmakers come back to town, uh, there is a conversation about whether this idea, this motion to vacate the idea of firing the speaker over Ukraine funding uh, was just nothing but an empty threat. Republican Congressman Michael McCall from Texas was on ABC this week over the weekend just yesterday, talked about why he believes Johnson did the right thing. Let's listen. I tell you what, he's got my support and he has a lot of I think he his the stock of Mike Johnson's gone way up. I think the respect for him has gone way up. 
because he did the right thing irrespective of his job. That garnered a lot of respect. And also from the Democrat side. Now, that's not what you normally want. Uh, but I do think... What's that, not what you normally want? Well... To rely on Democrats. To have to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, it shows you uh, that we're in a bipartisan era to some strange, in some strange way. <laughs> this strange bipartisan <laughs> thing that we're in. Uh, Rick, uh, when everyone's back tomorrow, is this even going to come up? Is Marjorie Taylor Greene all bluster? Are we done with the MTV? Yeah, this is a threat until it's not. And she does have a uh, motion to vacate that's been filed, so it's something that she could trigger if she wants. But you know what? I think uh, Speaker Johnson has basically called her bluff and said, do it! Yeah. You know, <laughs> Go ahead and try it. Let's see what happens. Because if she does that and he isn't removed and it's tabled because of an overwhelming support of the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus, mm. she looks foolish. Mm. So, you know, maybe she likes to look foolish as some evidence of that. But uh, in this case, I think all of this is, you know, pretty much just blue smoke and mirrors. Mm. So, Jeannie, who ruined it for Marjorie Taylor Greene? <laughs> was it the Democrats who said, yeah, we'll step up and protect him, or was it former President Donald Trump? Yeah, I, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene ruined it for herself. I mean, she simply hasn't looked at the reality that Republicans have a very, very slim margin of control in the House, and getting anything done depends on working across the aisle. And so, you know, but the reality is this is not a legislator either. I mean, she is not interested in legislating and governing. She is interested in getting on TV, making, you know, TikToks and fundraising, and that's what she's doing. And we're seeing the ramifications of that. And I do think the Democrats will and should save Mike Johnson. I'm just not sure how that really helps Mike Johnson in the end. But I do think Hakeem Jeffries will probably decide to be there to support the speaker because you shouldn't take somebody down because they did the right thing. Well, I guess some of the, the, the legislation she's authored uh, would include impeachment articles mm -hmm. for Joe Biden, or at least she helped. And then there was the amendment she had to conscript U.S. lawmakers in the right. Ukrainian military. That never got uh, passed, but it's a genius point. Our panel will stay with us coming up. We'll look back at quite the weekend. The White House Correspondents' Dinner, uh, President Biden taking a few jabs at Donald Trump. I had a great stretch since the State of the Union. Well, Donald has had a few tough days lately. You might call it stormy weather. I would like to point out, it's after 10 p.m. Sleepy Joe is still awake. While Donald Trump has spent the past week falling asleep in court every morning. That was Saturday Night Live writer and cast member Colin Jost poking fun at Biden and Trump's ages at the White House Correspondents' Dinner over the weekend. We're back with our political panel, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, for more. So, Rick, that was factually accurate. President Biden was in the room pretty late at night. He gave a speech <laughs> himself, cracked a few jokes about his own age, about his opponent. How important is a moment, an opportunity like that for a president who is trying to seek another term? Yeah, I think, look, these are all part of the game of running for president. And you have to be funny, right? It's a good thing. Uh, you can't take it too seriously. And and Joe Biden's always had a perchance for gaffes. Many of them included a joke that he was trying to tell that might not have been the right time or place. But everything I heard was that he was really good at it. And he was perfectly self-effacing. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think everybody had their favorites. But I, I would say the, the, the real joke was it's 10 o'clock and he was still talking. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you stayed out late that night. Oh, uh, God, mm. it was late. By, well, you know, he told uh, several jokes. The president, that is, about Donald Trump when he got his turn uh, following the actual comedian during the dinner. Let's listen to the president. Trump's so desperate, he started reading those Bibles he's selling. <laughs> then he got to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. That's when he put it down and said, this book's not for me. <laughs> you would expect uh, jokes about his political rival, Jeannie, but he also skewered the press a little bit. And there's been some writing about uh, Joe Biden's issues with what he considers in some cases to be unfair coverage. Where's the line on that before it's sour grapes? Are we going to hear about that through the whole campaign? 
Yeah, and, and he is not the first president to have issues with the press. No. This is an old story, and quite frankly, as you guys know, the way it should be, because your job is to cover him and be tough and ask tough questions, and of course, they don't like that. So I'm not surprised by that. It will continue specifically with the New York Times. I think, you know, one interesting thing about this dinner is that for years, the New York Times has not let its reporters go because worried right. about the cozy relationship there. So there is that issue, but I think it's also important Important to add that the White House Correspondents' Dinner raises money to support young upcoming journalists in this day and age. Boy, do we need that with scholarships and other things. So that work is critically important. So, you know, and I think the president did a good job um, doing this. I do think that it was a shame when Donald Trump didn't go for a few years. So it is nice that it is back in full force. But of course, during an election year, you also have to be careful that there is too cozy of a relationship with which turns people off as they look at Washington, D.C. So it's a fine line, as with everything else, for the president. Well, yeah, and one of the issues that people have with this president, Jeannie, is the fact that he's an octogenarian, which he's been leaning into more. He said at one point in his speech that he always does well in the original 13 colonies, for <laughs> example. Is that how he gets out of the age issue, just make people laugh it off and hope they forget? Yeah, he can't necessarily get out of it, but you're absolutely right. To make light of it, there was the joke about him running against a six-year-old. You know, he's got to turn this at least, not to his favor, because that's going to be hard to do, but at least, you know, nullify it. And I think that's what he's trying to do using humor. And I think so far that has been effective for him. If you were advising this president, Rick, and I know you're not, would it be to do more interviews, to interact more with the people who were sitting in that room, or wait for me to let you know when a, when a Howard Stern opportunity comes up, we're going to do it our way? Look, I think the biggest criticism I've heard of this administration is they have a communication problem, mm -hmm. right? That, that it's not what they're doing, that they don't communicate it very well, and that starts at the top. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm used to candidates like John McCain, who you couldn't get out of the press room, uh, and yet it served him incredibly well, right? And so... I think that this president needs to expose himself more to interviews and uh, both with the pencil press and, and yeah. the, in the media. And, and, and it's only he who can really drive the news of the day. It's not going to be his press secretary in the White House or anybody working for his campaign. Hmm. There you have it. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano. A great conversation to get our week started here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Kaylee, fascinating weekend. Now everybody can sleep it off. Yeah, or try to, at least, and hydrate. Hydration is a key so to this we recovery. Learned. In the meantime, <laughs> curl up with the Washington Edition newsletter. You can find it on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll be back tomorrow, where Donald Trump will be back in court in New York. This is Bloomberg TV and radio.